This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our Healthy You webinar series. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Back and Neck Pain Center at Mather Hospital, and we'll be talking about 10 surprising causes for your back and neck pain. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes, and your questions will remain anonymous like always. Today's presenters are Dr. Ben Eliyahu, Caitlin Conville, and Susan Precta Loper. Dr. Ben Eliyahu is the Administrative Director of the Back and Neck Pain Center at Mather Hospital and the Director of the Mather Chiropractic Collaboration Program. He has advanced certification in sports injuries and pain management, Dr. Ben Eliyahu has been in private practice in Selden, New York for 34 years, where he directs an integrated and collaborative spine and musculoskeletal practice. Caitlin Conville is a nurse practitioner and a program coordinator for the Back and Neck Pain Center at Mather. She received her Master of Science from Stony Brook University after completing their family nurse practitioner program. She joined the, she joined the Back and Neck Pain Center from the inpatient side of Mather, where she worked in orthopedics for over four years. Susan Prechtel Loper works in Mather's outpatient physical therapy department. She received her Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy and her master's degree in healthcare management from Stony Brook University. She has worked at Mather as a physical therapist for seven years. Dr. Ben Eliyahu, go ahead. Thank you, Emily. So as Emily said, today we're gonna to talk about some factors that can cause back pain that some people don't even think about. We're gonna give you some tips and ideas of how to mitigate those and prevent them. And some of these factors are actually perpetuating factors for back pain as well. And then we're gonna go into the different anatomical reasons that back pain occur, and then management things that you can do to help uh, relieve your back pain if you're experiencing it. Next slide. So back pain is prevalent in society. 80% of all people, especially in America, will have a back problem at some point in their lives. That's eight out of 10 people. That's pretty significant. 31 million Americans will experience low back pain at any given moment. And 25% new patients every year, 25% of our population will start experiencing a back problem. Low back pain was recently found to be the single leading cause of disability globally. And that was actually published in a very prestigious medical journal in Lancet in 2010. And not surprisingly, Americans spend more than $50 billion per year on back pain treatments. And that does not include some of the other additional costs like loss of productivity for work, um, some of the payments that go to insurance companies. That number, when you add those things in, actually is well over $100 billion a year. So back pain clearly is the number one source of chronic pain in the United States. It's the most common cause of job-related disability. And the rate of recurrence for back pain, which is a really important statistic, is 50% within one year and as high as 60 to 80% within two years. And that's mostly because people just chase symptoms and don't look for what causes back pain, um, whether that be an anatomical reason or some of the things we're gonna talk about today. Um, the other thing that's important to mention is, you know, during this last year with the pandemic, with lots of people working from home, lots of people doing a lot of extra sitting that they never used to do, has affected some of the things that we're going to talk about today that have been perpetuating factors and even causative factors. So I recently read an article uh, in a very good medical journal that talked about how the prevalence of low back pain and neck pain and spine problems has significantly gone up in this past year for a lot of people for some of the reasons we just described. So here you can see there's a list of 10 surprising causes of back pain that most people don't even think about. And we're gonna kind of touch on every one of them and give you some ideas of why that happens as well as why you need to change whatever it is that you may be doing in regards to those particular factors. So you can see on the list, wallets and purses are the first one. Um, so you can see in the picture on the left on the bottom, there's a pretty big wallet in that guy's pocket. So now picture that wallet 
which is probably three inches thick. And most, most wallets that men carry aren't three inches thick, but they could be on average two inches thick. But look at the picture far on your right, where the guy is sitting on the wall. And you can see a picture of the pelvis, the spine above it. And notice how the bone that's in our pelvis that we sit on, it's called the ischial tuberosity, not that that's important, but look how it raises that bone up. So as it raises that bone up, it creates a malalignment of the whole pelvic structure. And then look what happens to the spine. So if you're sitting eight to 10 hours a day, whether it be for work, whether it be for being on the computer, whether it be because you have nothing else to do and you're just sitting around, um, that will lead to back pain. So that's one reason. So look at the purse or the briefcase that the woman's carrying on the right side of that picture. So picture her carrying that heavy purse or briefcase or tote bag on her right shoulder. It will cause your spine to shift to this side because of the weight, but then your body wants to compensate for that and it brings you back this way. So that can create another whole set of mechanical shifts which cause stress and mechanical irritation of the pelvis, the sacroiliac joint and the joints. And we'll get into some of the anatomical things that I just mentioned so you can actually see what I'm talking about. So what to do? Obviously, try not to carry a wallet in your back pocket that's three inches thick. You know, they make very thin wallets that you can put um, one or two credit cards, driver's license, and some cash in. That makes a big difference. Or do what I do when I'm walking around. I don't put my wallet in my back pocket. I actually put it in my front pocket because A, um, it will be obviously less obtrusive to my pelvic mechanics. Um, and it's also a better place to leave it. And for women, you know, I think, you know, I've seen a lot of pocketbooks that have pretty much everything but the kitchen sink in them. And that's just a joke, of course. But um, I think if you just really take a look at what's in there and keep it to a bare minimum, um, I think that would really be really well as helping to reduce back issues. Next slide. So your couch. So you could take a picture of the and take a look at the picture on the top right, and we call that couch slouch. So that couch is not very uh, conducive to good sitting posture. So you can see we put a picture of the spine in that guy's back, but take a look at the way he's sitting. Notice that his head has shifted about two inches forward, and look at his spine and his upper back, how it's kind of arched forward. So those kinds of shifts undo the natural curves that you can see in that spine model. So if you can see in the lower back, there's a C curve and in the neck, there's the same C curve. None of those natural curves are being supported properly while he's sitting on that couch. And as a result, that causes mechanical stress. It causes muscular stress. And it'll only be a matter of a few weeks before this guy's experiencing headaches, neck pain, and back pain. For every two inches that you let your head shift forward like this, it's like taking a 20 pound weight and walking around with a 20 pound weight on your head. So obviously you want to try and improve your couch or your, your, the way you're sitting on the couch. So how do you do that? Well, if he took a pillow and he put it behind his lower back, number one. Number two, if he were to put something underneath his thighs or if that is a reclining couch, if you get yourself into a zero gravity position where your spine is nice and straight, your thighs are elevated, that would go a long way to reducing that mechanical stress. So clearly um, how you sit matters, how you sit on your couch matters, um, and poor posture is one of the biggest reasons for uh, perpetuating back pain and causing back pain. Next slide. So cell phones, there's actually a new condition that the AMA just added a, a specific diagnostic code for, and it's called text neck syndrome. So take a look at the picture on the right, and you can kind of get an idea of why it's called text neck, but if you've ever been out if you've ever been to a restaurant and shopping and you've watched people, you can see that everybody is on their phone like this, just texting away. Their head is forward, their posture is forward. And eventually what happens is it puts a tremendous mechanical stress on the joints of your neck. And as your posture shifts forward like this, it puts a lot of stress on your back as well. So a forward head position, weight on the cervical spine increases and it can cause permanent damage to not just the discs, but the joints, and it can result in headaches, back pain, and chronic muscle spasm. So what I was referring to is if you look at some of the pictures in the middle of that far right picture, um, the further tilt of the head, the more displacement of weight that's sitting on your head, and the more problems that you're gonna have in a matter of no time. So what should you do when you're texting? Bring it up to here. Instead of texting all the time down like this, which I see all everybody doing, if you bring your phone up to here and keep your neck here, there's no reason you can't text with one finger, or at the very least, if you like to text with two, 
I'm up here and I'm texting this way. It's just a simple behavioral change on your part, but it goes a long way to preventing chronic neck issues and, and eventually degeneration and disc decompression. So the other issue with cell phones is blue light. So most people don't even know about this, but pretty much televisions, iPads, telephones, computer monitors, all emit a particular wavelength of light that's blue, and it causes a lot of eye and retinal strain, and that can result in neck pain and headaches. So if you're on the computer all day long, uh, if you're watching television, you're on your iPad, uh, whatever it is, they make blue light eyeglasses that you can get in Staples. I've seen them in Staples, they're very inexpensive. If you have prescription eyeglasses, the next time you get a new pair, you should ask them to put a filter inside. It's clear, but it filters out that blue light. Uh, and then again, you can see on that poor posture picture on your far right, the way I was discussing, bringing your phone a little higher, instead of causing your whole spine to come forward to look down at the phone, just bring the phone a little higher so it, it doesn't put that mechanical strain on the joints of your neck. So driving, uh, along with posture, driving is an issue too. Because if you drive for a living, if you're in the car, you're a rep that goes from place to place, you drive a truck, um, you drive an hour to the city to do your job, whatever it is, sitting for prolonged periods without proper support um, can cause a lot of back muscle stiffness and lead to spasm as well. So how do you alleviate back pain while driving? So you want to avoid that position that we just talked about where you're leaning forward and over you. And I've seen as I drive, I notice this all the time, people are leaning over their seat and over their driving wheel and they're going like this. Um, you know, obviously cars today, they come equipped with lumbar supports and neck supports. Um, it's just a matter of changing the way you sit and changing your behavior. So get comfortable, sit properly. Um, don't drive for hours at a time. There's nothing wrong with taking a 15 minute break and getting out and stretching. Shift your, period, shift your position periodically and then support your feet and use cruise control. So if you know you're on a highway, there's no reason for you to sit over your wheel and just constantly drive like that. Put cruise control on and then get yourself comfortable. So driving and sitting definitely has a postural strain aspect as well. Next. Here's one that nobody really thinks about is your feet. So feet play a tremendous role in not just causing back pain, but also perpetuating back issues that are already there. Um, what kind of foot problems am I talking about? I'm talking about flat feet. You can look at the very top picture on the deformation of the foot. Um, the normal foot, if you look at the, the middle picture where the blue is, the ball of your foot and the heel of your foot should be the one that contacts the ground the most. So if you were to be walking on a beach in the sand, as you walk, if you look back to your footprint, you would actually see if your foot didn't have really flat arches, you would actually see what we're looking at in that middle blue picture. So if you have flat feet, what you're gonna see is that top black, that top blue picture. So how does that affect your spine? Well, if you have really flat feet, your feet kind of turn in like this and from your feet up, to your legs and to your pelvis and spine, it causes all kinds of mechanical deformation and shifts and puts you out of alignment. That perpetuates back pain. Flip-flops, if you've, most people have flip-flops. If you've noticed, they're extremely flat. There's no support in them whatsoever. And if you look at a pair of flip-flops that you have in your closet that you've had for two years, you'll notice that they wear out quite a bit on the outside back part of your heel, on the inside pack where your ball, your foot is. So you're not getting proper support and so in the summer, you know, I see most people just walking around with these, these fashionable flip-flops that have zero arch support in them. That's causing them to have pronation issues where their feet are going in like this and it just perpetuates and causes back pain. So what should you do? Make sure that you, if you're running and walking and exercising, you have a good pair of sneakers that, that I always recommend patients use running shoes that have good arch supports in them. And number two, if you're gonna wear flip-flops, there are certain companies that make really decent sized sandals, decent sandals that have arch supports in them. Birkenstock is one that comes to mind. Um, there's a bunch of companies that have them. Spenko is another one and they're relatively inexpensive and they have decent arch supports in them as opposed to those flat ones that cost like $8. Next slide. So smoking, you know, smoking has been an issue for, for as long as I can remember, um, mostly because of the effects that it has on lungs and other organs in the body, but there's now a lot of research that show that if you smoke, 
it's going to progress, uh, prevent you from healing, even with your back. There's many spine surgeons now that if you told them you're a two packer and you smoke constantly, they probably will not operate on you because there's lots of research that actually shows, excuse me one second. Don't know why that happened. All right, sorry about that. My computer logged out for a second unexpectedly. Um, so back to smoking. So smoking definitely causes uh, a delay in the healing process and surgeons won't even operate now if you tell them you're a smoker. Why does that happen? Because nicotine reduces blood flow to the arteries that supply the spine and give the spine the nutrients that it needs to heal. Quitting smoking will decrease the chances of getting back pain because you have better blood flow. When you have decreased blood flow, it causes your discs to actually degenerate, um, as well as there are many other reasons to quit smoking that includes not getting lung cancer, not getting stomach problems and cardiovascular problems. And in a study published in the magazine and journal Curious, they found that there was a distinct proven gradient and relationship between back pain and smoking. So it's hard to quit, I get it, but it's something that you owe your health and life to, and it def definitely affects your back. Next. Sitting, we talked a little bit about sitting. <clears throat> so you can see the proper sitting posture. Um, when you sit all day, it can make your neck get tense. Your trap muscles, which are up here, get really tense. And as that occurs and those muscles become tense, it brings your shoulders up to your neck. And I'm exaggerating. But what that does is it creates a lot of stress and tension in your neck region. Um, the other thing it does, it, the longer you sit, there's a lot of research that shows that sitting increases the pressure in your lower back discs by sixfold. So if there's a normal resting pressure in that disc, which sits between the vertebrae of approximately maybe 10 millimeters of mercury, you now have 60 millimeters of mercury of pressure in that disc. So that causes the disc material to bulge out. Hips become weak, you can develop knee pain, you can get sciatica. Um, so how do you sit better? You sit better by putting your back up against the chair, making sure your thighs are perpendicular to your calf, um, and making sure you're supported properly. I even tell patients to put a little box under your feet to make sure that it forces you to stay in the erect position. Next. And here are some tips. You know, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that she's sitting on a ball. Um, that, if you sit at the edge of the ball, it promotes really good posture. Then there's these other chairs that you can see, the kneeling chair that you can get online. Um, it forces you to sit in a properly aligned position. Um, there are standing desks you can see on the bottom picture um, that actually, if you work at a desk all day, by sitting down and standing, you can change the position of your desk. It gives your spine a little rest. And then again, if you look at the correct posture picture, you can see how she's sitting perfectly. Her spine is straight. Her thighs are perpendicular to her calves. The monitor is at eyesight, and that will be a great way to sit to reduce tension in your spine. Next picture. So I'm gonna hand it over to Caitlin now, who's a nurse practitioner in our program. And she's gonna talk about some more factors. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Conville. Um, I'm going to start by talking to you a little bit about obesity and poor nutrition. So one thing that not everyone thinks about every day is the way in which the size of our body can cause back pain. So obesity in America has become increasingly prevalent, and the latest CDC, CDC statistics indicate that 42.5 of, adult, uh, of adults over the age of 20 have a BMI that categorizes them as obese, while 73.6% uh, of adults over the age of 20 are classified as overweight, which includes those with BMIs um, in, the, in the obesity category. So multiple studies have been conducted to study the relationship between back pain and increased body size. And a meta-analysis of these studies found that being overweight or obese was a significant factor in both developing and perpetuating back pain. As you can see here on the right, when our bodies are a healthy weight, our systemic levels of inflammation are low, we have low levels of mechanical stress on our low back, and the ground reaction force is low. So as our body size increases, inflammation levels go up, the extra weight that we are carrying increases the mechanical stress levels on our back, 
our muscle strength decreases and the ground reaction force increases. And all these factors work together to cause or worsen back pain. So we all know that increased body weight can contribute to health problems, including back pain, but what can we do to reduce this risk factor? So it's important not just to seek redu to reduce calorie intake and increase exercise to decrease our body size, but it's also really important to recognize what, that what you eat matters. So certain foods in our diet can actually increase inflammatory markers in the body, and they can contribute to pain and inflammation, while other foods can help to decrease inflammation in the body. So now I'm here, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that role of diet and nutrition um, as it applies to reduction and management of inflammation and pain. So on the left here, we have examples of foods that are not the healthiest foods in the world, foods that promote inflammation in the body and promote weight gain while providing very few nutritional benefits. On the right, you can see fresh, colorful produce, high in antioxidants, high in vitamins and minerals, and these all serve to reduce inflammation in the body. So again, research shows that our diet plays a significant role in inflammation and pain in the body. Um, and inflammation is an important underlying mechanism for the development of many chronic diseases, including type two diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and cancer. So increased inflammation in the body is also found in patients with chronic pain. So if we can recognize the foods that reduce inflammation, such as plant-based foods, as well as those that promote inflammation, we can make diet modifications that can decrease inflammation in the body and can help to reduce our pain. And go to the next slide. Thank you. So anti-inflammatory diets. So on the left here, we have the food pyramids for both the Mediterranean diet and a whole foods plant-based diet, which are both anti-inflammatory diets that provide excellent guidelines for how to make diet modifications that will reduce inflammation in the body. So you can take a little look at those. Um, inflammation in the body, again, can be either positively or negatively affected by the food that we eat. So pro-inflammatory foods um, include things like saturated fats, which are found in meat, especially red meat, and whole fat dairy products. Trans fats, which are found in hydrogenated oils, so like the oils that we use to make baked goods, packaged goods, crackers, things like that. Um, Omega-6 fatty acids, which are found in oils such as corn oil, safflower oil, soybean oil, and in sugar and sugar-laden foods. Um, whereas anti-inflammatory foods, um, the ones that reduce inflammation markers in the body, include things such as omega-3 fatty acids, which um, can be found in canola oil and walnuts, monounsaturated fats, which are seen in olive oil, peanut oil, nuts, and avocado, fruits and vegetables and whole grains, the more colorful, the better, and many different herbs, spices, and teas. All right, anxiety and stress. So another surprising cause of back pain um, is seen with the experience of anxiety or stress. So when your body experiences a stressor, whether that be anxiety related to your job or the loss of a loved one, stress over bills, et cetera, your sympathetic nervous system responds by releasing stress hormones. So the release of stress hormones, such as cortisol and catecholamines, they activate a bodily response in which the body prepares for an emergency response by increasing your heart rate, your respiratory rate, and muscle tension. So this this fight or flight response is extremely useful from an evolutionary perspective, such that it prepares us to run away from danger or avoid bodily harm when faced with a threat to our lives. But when we are regularly experiencing stress and therefore experiencing this fight or flight response, it can start to inflict a lot of harm on our bodies. Next slide, please. All right, so anxiety and stress, the cause and effect. So if you look here on the right, you can see some of the effects of this regular experience of stress. Um, that can include lack of concentration, low energy, headaches, increased pain, depression, a suppressed immune system, increased blood pressure and heart rate, joint pain, muscle tension, protein breakdown, decreased bone density, and a change in appetite that can lead to weight gain among others. So with regard to the experience of pain, um, the, ex the experience of psychological stress in particular can have a really negative cyclical effect on the body. So if you look here on the left, you can see how psychological stress, which can, um, can lead to pain as we discussed, and then that in turn can cause us to react to that pain with things like muscle guarding, um, which can then restrict our range of motion, which can then lead to muscle weakness and atrophy and decreased function, um, which then in turn leads to more psychological distress. Uh, next slide. So now that we know some of the ways that chronic stress can negatively affect our well-being, how can we work to reduce our stress levels on a daily basis? So some ways that we can minimize stress include setting a schedule. So putting your plans out on paper, see if you're doing too much. Um, you can evaluate what a doable schedule looks like for you and make adjustments to your activities accordingly um, to avoid overbooking, overstressing. Um, that also allows you to carve out some time so that you can rest, you can decompress, practice self-care in between all of your activities. 
um, eating a healthy diet, which we discussed, exercising regularly, um, developing good sleep habits. So sleep, sleep loss in particular, it can make it harder to manage your blood sugar and stress levels. So aiming for seven to eight hours of sleep can help keep your blood sugar, your appetite, and your stress all at normal levels, which can help with back pain. Um, changing your expectations. So it's really easy to get overwhelmed by doing too many activities, having tons of responsibilities, trying to do it all. So by deciding which activities offer the most positive impact on your life, you can eliminate some activities that weigh you down and spend your time engaging in things that you actually enjoy doing um, and things that have a positive effect on your well-being. And then breathing, meditation, and yoga. So sometimes it's important to just take time to stop, take a deep breath, and give our bodies the oxygen that it needs. So pausing for deep breathing can help to reduce your level, um, your levels of negative stress and taking out time for meditation and yoga can really amplify this effect even further. And next slide. All right, lack of exercise. So many of us do not get enough exercise. And I think that COVID kind of amplified this effect. Gyms were closed, everybody was staying indoors. Um, so exercise is really important in the prevention and management of back pain um, as it can lead to, you know, lack of exercise can lead to the weakening of the muscles that provide support to your back. So a lack of core strength, which our physical therapist will discuss with you a little bit further, um, is a common cause of low back pain. And um, exercise, you know, can make us feel good. It can lead to the release of endorphins, which relieves stress, muscle tension, improves mood and sleep. Um, but making sure that we exercise in a safe way for our bodies, incorporating stretching, strengthening cardiovascular exercise into our daily routines can really help to maintain overall health and improve back pain. So as a preventative measure, regular exercise is key. Um, if you have back or neck pain, it can really be helpful to work with a provider, such as a physical therapist. And this way you can develop an exercise plan that's really safe and appropriate for whatever condition that you have. Um, all right, so what do you do if you have pain in your back and neck? We're talking about all these ways to prevent it, all the things that might be causing back pain or neck pain. But what if you do? What if you have an injury or if you do, you do develop pain? Um, so these are just some basic things we're going to go over. We're going to elaborate on some a little bit later in the presentation. So if you have an injury, if you feel pain, you can use home care, things such as just resting, um, using ice or heat for pain. Um, there are options with conservative measures such as physical therapy or chiropractic care. We're going to talk about those a little bit more. Um, acupuncture and massage therapy can be great. Um, we do here have the Back and Neck Pain Center where we help to diagnose you know, the causes of your pain and help you find treatment. Um, and then just we put in this in here, just so you're aware of some serious injuries, red flags that um, warrant further investigation um, in an emergency room. Um, things like fever, loss of bowel or bladder function, possible fracture from a fall or injury, um, major muscle weakness, progressive loss of sensation, um, and severe unrelenting pain. So things that really, you know, we don't want you to care for at home that we prefer that you seek um, further care for. Um, all right, so I'm going to hand you back off to Dr. Ben Eliyahu. He's going to review our risk assessment tool with you. Thank you, Kaylin. So this is a tool that we always use in clinical practice, um, and we want you to just take two minutes to fill it out. Um, there's about 10 questions, I think, and then we use this in clinical practice. Insurance companies require us to get these types of surveys filled out, and they want us to report on this because this looks at function. Um, it looks at your pain and it looks at your stress and anxiety levels. So take a minute, maybe 60 seconds, and just jot down how many you answered yes to. And then down on the bottom, there's a Q&A session that's anonymous. Just go ahead and just type in your number. Um, that's also a place to add questions later, and we'll answer them later. Um, but let's wait 60 seconds and go ahead and just put down your number so I get an idea of where people are. And then we'll actually come back to this later and, um, and discuss what the meaning of it is and how it affects the quality of your life. So we'll wait about 60 seconds. And then please go ahead and stick the number in. Um, Okay, another 10 seconds, and then we'll start it up again. And you can still put the number in there as I'm continuing to talk. 
Okay, so what are some common anatomical reasons? You know, what goes wrong? What does it affect in our body? So we're just gonna to touch on a few common ones. Uh, we'll start with the far right where you see muscular pain. So you see all those red dots. So those red dots represent knots in your muscle or what we call trigger points. So the muscle contracts in a bitten piece of the muscle and it makes this contraction knot that actually generates pain. So why does that happen? and can it cause pain? The answer is yes, it can cause pain. And the reason why it happens is for a multitude of problems, such as a trauma, the way you sit posturally. So if you're doing text necking and you're down like this all the time and your neck is just strained, those muscles will respond by becoming very tight and eventually they'll develop these focal knots of contraction that we call trigger points. Um, spinal problems, whether they be discs or joints, or nerve pinching, that can cause the muscles to spasm as well. When we go to the middle section, patients can get radicular pain, which is pain down the arm. Uh, and sometimes muscles can actually mimic uh, pinched nerves or radicular pain. So sciatica is a type of radicular pain. Sciatica is pain down the leg, but that can happen from a muscle spasming too and kind of mimic what a pinched nerve would cause. Then on the far left, we have conditions that can affect the joints. Um, the joints are the little kind of spaces between our vertebrae that allow us to bend and move in each direction. And then lastly, the sacroiliac joint, which is the pelvis joint that you can see on the very bottom picture above the word Mather Hospital. That's in your pelvis, there's one on each side, and sometimes those can slip, those can get stuck, and it can cause obviously back pain as well. That particular joint is, it tends to be underdiagnosed and overlooked, and it's extremely common in women who are pregnant or who have given birth, and even patients who have had back surgery. It's usually an underlooked reason for chronic pain. So as you heard in the beginning, I'm a chiropractic physician. I've been in practice for upwards of 37 years. I direct the Back and Neck Pain Center program. I also direct a collaborative chiropractic community program here at the hospital. And I, I've been in private practice for 37 years. And I'm just gonna briefly talk about chiropractic care. You know, in a, in a setting like this where it's a webinar, it's hard to get a poll and see how many people have actually been to chiropractors. But for those of you who have been um, and you know what chiropractic care is, you know, I'm sorry, just bear with me for a minute. So it's a drugs-free, hands-on approach. Uh, the length of chiropractic education is pretty much identical to medical school. We use much of the same books and learn much of the same coursework, except we're non-pharmacological, so we don't prescribe medicine. Chiropractic care over the last decade or two has been now been recommended as a first-line approach for neck and back pain by many agencies that would surprise you. The American Medical Association, the FDA, the CDC, the Joint Commission of Hospitals, and even the American College of Family Physicians. And what a lot of people don't know is that the veteran hospitals across the United States, and there are about 100, uh, now have chiropractors on staff. Uh, I'm gonna go over a little bit of what chiropractors do. And we have in this hospital about 30 chiropractors who have been uh, vetted and screened for participation in our program. Next. So what kind of things do chiropractors do? Well, there's a large overlap between what chiropractors do and physical therapists do, and yet there are some very significant differences. So chiropractors, you can see up on the left-hand top picture, um, he's mobilizing that person's back. In the far right upper picture, he's using a tool that we call an activator tool, which is a very gentle way of mobilizing the joints. Down towards the middle, we do a lot of myofascial work and we work on muscle spasm and break up trigger points. And then some of the things you can see on the bottom is we do traction, cold laser therapy, and we also recommend um, exercise rehabilitation, both for in-home use and in, and in the office using very low technology tools like bands and, um, and big balls. One of the other things that I use a lot in my practice and some chiropractors do as well, is something called spinal disc decompression. So many patients come to the chiropractor with disc problems, generative discs, bulging discs, sciatica, and a tool that actually helps to decompress that disc is called the spinal decompression table. And there are two pictures on your bottom right. One, the person's on their back, it's called the Triton table. And then the one that I use mostly is the one where the patient's laying on their stomach and the table goes back and forth. It's called auto distraction. And as you do that auto distraction technique, it actually decreases the disc pressure and it's by negative pressure. So if you look at the MRI picture in the middle, you can see that the picture before spinal decompression therapy, the disc actually is sticking out quite a bit. And then a lot of patients, the disc actually goes away on re-imaging. 
So spinal traction or spinal disc decompression works by creating a negative pressure in the disc, kind of bringing the disc material back into the middle and decreasing the pressure that's built up. Next. So here's another picture. Um, this is called a Cox table. It's the one that I use primarily. The table goes up and down. So the guy's left, the doctor's left hand will move the table up and down. And again, it decreases intradiscal pressure, enhances biomechanics of the facet joints, and it can be done in the back as the top left picture is showing. And it can also be done in the neck. And then you can see on the bottom, again, a little more clearer. If you look at the before treatment picture, you can see how that bottom disc in the red circle it's protruding into the white space. We call that a disc herniation. And then if you look at the same patient a few months later, you can see that the treatment has actually assisted in bringing that disc back in and unpinching the nerve. Um, I'm gonna talk about a research project that I actually was involved in and actually published. We used 27 patients and um, the MRI places were kind enough to actually do repeat MRIs along the course of treatment. And the bottom line here is that most people think that once they get a herniated disc, that's it, they need surgery, that's not gonna get better. But in fact, the research shows clearly that's not the case, that most patients actually do get better. And this study actually showed that, that 80 to 90% of the patients clinically get better, go back to work, and almost two thirds, upwards of 70%, um, the picture that you're seeing on the top right corner, the red arrow shows the protruding disc, the green hour shows how it resorbed. That's called a sagittal cut. And on the very bottom, that's a cross cut through the disc. The bottom left-hand picture, you can see there's a significant difference between that picture and the right picture. So the bottom line is that disc decompression gets disc better. Next slide. So I'll end on this one and then we'll bring in the physical therapist to talk about physical therapy. So, you know, if you'd asked um, the AMA about 25 years ago, you know, should I go to a chiropractor? I think we all know the answer would have been, are you crazy? No. Um, however, in the last two decades, there's been a significant amount of random control clinical trial, really good research projects and studies published in some very prestigious medical journals. And the AMA has gone a complete 180 on recommending, recommending chiropractic care for back pain. So much so that in a recent JAMA article, the one on the right, they actually looked at the effect of usual medical care plus chiropractic care versus medical care alone for U.S. service members, and hands down found that collaborative care, when you combine medical care with chiropractic care working together, um, patients get much, much better and they get better results, better outcomes. And obviously that makes a better soldier, but we can extrapolate that to the society. And that's how our program works, by the way. We integrate multiple different types of care together and we take a team approach to helping people get better. If it means that you have to get uh, PT and chiropractic care along with medicine, then so be it. Um, Susan's going to talk about our PT program and, and the role of PT in helping people get better. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Prechtel Loper. I'm a physical therapist in the area with over um, 30 to 40 years of experience in the area and seven years here at uh, Mather Hospital's outpatient physical therapy department. So I'm here to give you a little background and knowledge about our outpatient department and what physical therapy really is and what physical therapy is about. Mather's Outpatient Physical Therapy Clinic has been serving the local community here for more than actually 40 years because I was a student here about 40 years ago at Mather. Um, Mather's outpatient or their outpatient department has been showing continuous growth and offering new programs to meet the needs and demands of our patient throughout these years. Um, specifically, like we've been discussing is our back and neck program. We've got lymphedema and we are working on a vestibular and a balance uh, program, which will be coming up shortly. Um, our department has many expert clinicians with a wide range of clinical experience and many years, different various years of experience. And uh, the majority of the PTs uh, in the clinic today have their doctorates of physical therapy. We do provide our patients with an individualized uh, attention and customized program. Um, when you begin with PT here, you are set up with an evaluation, which is a slotted 60 minute evaluation. And it's a one-on-one -on -one eval with your physical therapist. Um, and then from that, they will make a customized program for you and develop your home exercise program for you at that time too. We work very closely with the Back and Neck Center. We attend their 
weekly meetings um, to discuss each and every individual case. And it's usually our assistant director for the PT department who does go to those weekly meetings. Now I'd like to give you a little brief overhead on what uh, understanding what physical therapy is. Physical therapy is a conservative approach to rehabilitate your neck and or back problems in order to, to decrease your pain, promote mobility, increase your strength and your stability, and overall improve your quality of life. Physical therapy, oh, back. <laughs> physical therapy helps to prevent the onset and slow the progression of conditions resulting from injury, disease, and other causes. And if you look at the picture above, it kind of gives you an overview of our clinic setting. We have a pretty spacious setting and we have a very uh, well-equipped gym with treadmills and new steps and upright and uh, uh, recumbent bicycles and ellipticals um, and actually separate treatment tables for individual treatment too. Next slide. Okay, next I'd like to go over the various benefits of physical therapy. I think it's important to note that physical therapy does work um, with pain management, uh, trying to reduce the needs for opioids or non-narcotic pain relievers. Um, we work hard to try to have our patients avoid surgery as much as possible. We also improve a patient's mobility and movement with or without having had surgery or working with their mobility and their movement uh, for uh, pre-op if they are having um, surgery to be done on their neck or spine. Uh, we work to facilitate recovery from injury and trauma. We, physical therapy, the benefits are also there to uh, improve strength, balance and endurance and flexibility, which all helps to reduce the risk of falls, specifically in the elderly population. And uh, we also always incorporate the uh, management of age-related medical issues, such as if you have high blood pressure, any respiratory issues, like I said before, vestibular balance issues, arthritis, diabetes, and most recently, anybody that may be dealing with some post-COVID sy symptoms too right now. Next. Next, I'd like to go over briefly our treatment techniques that we utilize in physical therapy. One of the big ones is therapeutic exercises, which always includes stretching, where it's whether it's manual stretching by the PT, but also always teaching our uh, patients how to self-stretch for their home programs, strengthening, always we'll get a little further into this, but core stability, posture re-education, which helps tremendously with our neck and back patients. We always can incorporate aerobic activities for endurance if uh, indicated for an individual patient where, like I said before, we have our treadmills, we have our bikes, um, we have the elliptical, and we do have the new Biodex, which is a balanced trainer, which um, also will help with uh, posture issues too with the balanced trainer. Another technique that's always incorporated with our back and neck patients is the use of manual therapy, which uh, we utilize soft tissue mobilization, myofascia release techniques. Again, like I said before, manual stretching, the PT stretching out your various muscles as needed, um, and also joint mobilization if it's indicated for an individual patient after their evaluation was done. The modalities that we offer here in our clinic include ice, the cold packs. We have heat, which is moist heat. We have electric stim sometimes is used for muscle re-education, for pain management. We have the ultrasound machines. And last, we do have a traction uh, unit and machine, which is utilized if indicated. We always work on functional activities, a big part of our program, because we want to see our patients return back to work back to the gym, back to their recreational activities or sports or whatever it is that they really want to get back to, or those that are at home who just want to get back to their activities of daily living around the house, just cleaning, cooking, and doing their basic stuff at home. Every patient is provided with a written and explained home exercise program that is developed and advanced throughout the course of your stay, which always incorporates, you know, education for the for the patient. And lastly, um, like I said earlier, we do work a lot with postural education because as Dr. Ben said, postural 
um, is so important for reducing back and neck pain, as you've seen with the cell phone and so much that we do today in our daily lives. And lastly, we will go over proper lifting techniques for our patients so that you don't get re-injured when you go back out into doing your, your daily activities. Like I said earlier, um, a big focus on PT for our backs and neck is core strengthening. And another word for core strengthening is strengthening your abdominal muscles to support your, your body. And your core muscles are located deep within your trunk, extending from the base of your head all the way down to your pelvis. And its function is like a corset and protecting your spine as you move and you do your activities. Um, strong core muscles always make it easier and safer to do most of your daily physical activities and, you know, it incorporates recreational activities too. When you have weak core muscles, it can cause back and neck pain, muscle in injury, and make you more susceptible to poor posture, which becomes kind of like a vicious circle throughout time with that. Now I'd like to discuss what makes us here at Mather Hospital, our outpatient physical therapy back and neck section, a little different than other ones that you may have been to or know about in the local area, is that um, we, we are, you know, associated with the McKenzie Institute um, uh, of uh, New Zealand. Actually, it was the late Robin McKenzie over in New Zealand who developed this approach. And we've added this to our clinic and our practitioners have been well-trained and some of them are certified in this technique. It is an effective evidence-based approach to treating the back and neck. Um, the clinician here will go through during your evaluation a series of repeated movements to find out what is called your directional preference, which usually is um, a, a flexion-based exercise or an extension-based exercise. And it's really um, looked at through the evaluation to determine which way we will go and what approach we'll take. Once that directional preference is found, an exercise program will be created to promote movements that will reduce or localize your symptoms of whether it's radicular pain or localized back pain or, you know, down the leg, down the arm, and then you're taught to avoid those motions um, that produce or increase your symptoms. Now, let me go a little further into the McKenzie method therapy. McKenzie method is an effective evidence-based approach to treating the neck and the back. Symptoms um, the clinician will go through the series again of the repeated uh, movements to find what is a directional preference, which I said before, basically and simply would be flexion of the spine or extension of the spine. Once it's found, the program is created to promote, to promote those movements to localize your symptoms and avoid the motions that, that um, will increase those symptoms. Um, the technique is designed for the body to heal itself and the patient has learned, is, is taught how to do these. So you really become independent eventually in learning how to control your symptoms and how to self-treat yourself and how to prevent yourself from having relapses. Um, and the picture down on the bottom left is just a basic picture showing somebody who did have sometimes not necessarily back pain. Sometimes somebody will come in and just have leg pain, you know, referred pain, sciatic pain. And through the use of the McKenzie method, we're looking to do centralization where we're taking those symptoms out of the leg. And if you see it going back up into the back and then eventually centralizing in the back and then disappearing completely from, from the back. So that, um, that ties up my presentation. And now I'm going to pass it over to Caitlin. All right. Um, hello again. So I'm just going to briefly give you a quick overview of the Back and Neck Pain Center and just how we're different. So here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we provide evidence-based multidisciplinary care customized by a clinical team um, with a collaborating physician and guided by myself, the nurse practitioner. So again, Dr. Ben briefly touched on this, but when we talk about multidisciplinary care, um, refer we're referring to the fact that we have multiple providers from many different disciplines, and that includes spine surgery, interventional pain management, physical therapy, and a chiropractor, and we all work together to coordinate your care. So we meet once weekly, we review patient charts, and this allows providers from different backgrounds to all weigh in on the selected treatment plan and provide their, un your, 
their unique perspectives. Um, at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we aim to reduce recurrent episodes of back and neck pain in the future by teaching about adopting a healthy lifestyle. Um, we also avoid the use of high-risk pain medications. So while one of our goals is to alleviate your pain, we also want to find the underlying cause of your pain and provide treatment that addresses this underlying cause. Um, at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we also identify and address disparity of care factors. So there are many factors that make it difficult for individuals to access treatment. This includes things like financial obstacles, transportation issues, mobility issues, comorbid medical conditions, mental health issues, and just difficulty managing multiple appointments with different providers. So here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we aim to identify these factors and provide assistance to ensure that you're able to get the treatment that you need. All right, so the step ladder approach. So this graphic depicts our approach to treatment at the Back and Neck Pain Center. We use what we like to call a step ladder approach. And with this approach, we aim to provide the least invasive effective treatment option for your condition. So for most people, this means starting with conservative treatment measures such as physical therapy or chiropractic care. If you have already tried conservative measures without improvement, or if your condition warrants further intervention, we may start a little bit higher on the ladder with interventional pain management or one of our support programs. So in cases where you have red flags that we talked about earlier, um, or signs or symptoms that there's an urgent condition, we might send you directly to a spine surgeon. Um, statistically, ap approximately 75% of our patients improve with conservative measures, um, but we continue to evaluate you throughout the course of treatment and recommend additional treatments or steps as appropriate. Um, about 20% of our patients utilize pain management treatment options and about 5% have spinal surgery. Um, so our overall goal is to provide the most appropriate treatment for you and treatment that will be effective in reducing your pain and will help you to regain function. So if you have any questions about the Back and Neck Pain Center, the type of care we provide, or you'd like to reach out to us to schedule an appointment, we're going to give our contact information in, um, at the end of the presentation. And I'm always happy to speak with you and address any questions or concerns that you may have. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Ben, and he's just going to go over the results of your risk assessment with you. So if you put in, if some, I think some people put the number in, but if you score two or above, and I generally say three or above, um, it indicates you are having a problem that's affecting not just your pain level, but also most importantly, your function and how you function and how it affects the quality of your life. So it's affecting your, your hobbies and affecting maybe even work. Um, so as Caitlin said, you know, we're here to help. If you have any questions, you can email us, you can call us. We're happy to answer any questions you have. Our center takes most insurance plans. Um, and you know we work with almost every insurance company. Next. So in conclusion, there are many, we went over about 10 different everyday causes that most people don't even think about. Um, some that you probably knew about and didn't even you know, give it any consideration. Um, recognize the things that you do that can cause back and neck pain can help prevent and manage that pain. Uh, clearly, Caitlin talked about how you should change and adopt your lifestyle, adopt safe habits, try to exercise more, improve your posture, and manage stress and pain through some of the techniques that she discussed and I discussed with you. We're here to help if you have issues. So if the pain is not going away and it's become chronic, if your disability and functional level um, that we used on that particular tool that we asked you to fill out was you know three, four or higher, that means that it's not, it's not going away and you probably do need to have it managed. Some of the things that we do here, we talked about the statistic of how back pain can be recurrent from year to year to year. The reason why that happens is because you didn't look at all the risk factors that allow it to keep coming back many of which are some of the things that we discussed today. And we try to identify all those risk factors, manage those risk factors, and most importantly, get you to the right provider to help you get better. So for more information, if you just jot down this email address, um, you can even call us if you like. We're happy to get on the phone with you and answer any questions you have. Um, and you can see on the bottom, you know, this guy just can't figure out what's causing his stabbing pain. And unfortunately, I mean, it's a joke, obviously, and it's a comic joke, but, you know, obviously sometimes things are right there in front of you and you didn't realize it. And we hope to cover a lot of those today.